Um, kia ora and ngā mihi nui ki a koutou katoa. Good morning everybody, I'm your host Helen Fett, I'm a researcher at Lincoln University and I'm a board member of ITSNZ and it's my very great pleasure from a slightly grey Christchurch this morning to welcome you here to this webinar on data-driven service design for demand responsive transport. Today we're going to hear about how New Zealand fleet operators in the public and community transport sectors are applying a data-driven approach to enhance their offerings and apply demand responsive transport technology to provide services for their passengers. We have four fantastic speakers for you today. If you could move the slide on, please, Simon. First, we're going to hear about the process of selection, design and implementation of an all-electric fleet of on-demand vehicles from Michael Vayner of Auckland Transport. After that, we'll look at co-creating My Mobigo, a collaboration between Howick and Eastern Buses, part of Transdev Australia, and Liftango, and that will be presented by Troy O'Day. We'll then follow up by exploring Good Friends Go, a community and aged care on-demand transport service with Rachel Hopkins of Arvida Group. And our final presentation, we'll dive into the process of data-driven service design for DRT, with Tristan Eels of Liftango. We'll then have a quick update from the Executive Officer of ITSNZ, Simon McManus, and we'll wrap up with audience Q&A time with our panelists. Now, as you listen to the speakers, do please feel free to submit your questions via the chat box on your screen. Don't feel you have to wait until the end to submit your questions, but we will be saving all the questions for speakers until the last part of the session. As we're doing all the questions at the end, when you type your question, please do say who that question is directed to. And it is of course fine to direct questions to the whole panel. We'd also really appreciate it if you'd include your name and your affiliation when you type your questions so that our panelists know who they're talking to and can tailor their answers if appropriate. For now though, it's time for everyone to sit back, enjoy the ride as we welcome our first speaker. Michael Vayner has worked in urban innovation and transportation for 15 years. At Auckland Transport, he leads the design and integration of on-demand solutions into the public transport network. Responding to changing mobility needs, Michael focuses on improving access and connectivity whilst encouraging a mode shift away from private cars. So over to you, Michael. Thank you, Helen. Uh, good morning from Auckland. Uh, a bit gloomy day today, but uh, I'm hoping to, to see more sun very soon as we are approaching the summer. Um, so this is indeed a very special time to be talking about the on-demand services in Auckland, as we are just in the final stages of introducing the next um, 80 local trial in South Auckland. It will be live uh, this Sunday, and I'll talk more about it later in my presentation. But let's start with um, why we are introducing on-demand in Auckland. Um, so Auckland Transport recognizes that uh, transportation needs of the local population are changing and the need to adapt. Um, the roadmap uh, addresses the way forward to, for Auckland Transport. We in, uh, in, indeed have um, introduced um, uh, on-demand and shared mobility roadmap, which uh, guides, which gives us the principles uh, of um, introducing this type of services uh, and the, the governing principle of that is uh, to pilot test and grow um, we do recognize that there's a need to innovate and seek alternative ways of transportation and this was apparent even before the, the pandemic but with COVID-19 um, it has become even more urgent uh, for example the emerging trends with fewer commuter type trips to the city center, for example, in the uh, morning peaks. Um, also, the, there is an expectation that there would be more local trips. Um, and um, this indeed triggers the need to um, redesign and try these new types of uh, solution for the public. Last, we also believe that um, on-demand type of solutions have the potential to encourage mode shift away from private vehicles, which are very dominant uh, in many um, parts of Auckland, um, most, most of Auckland, in fact. And so we are hoping by introducing the fleet of um, 
electric vehicles through the on-demand trial, that this would also contribute to our decarbonization policy. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, let's talk about the uh, Devonport trial for a moment. So uh, this trial was introduced uh, almost three years ago now as a standalone service, and it was aimed to allow connections to ferry terminal in Devonport. There were six electric vehicles uh, operating in the area, and um, these have been very well received. So this, this positive sign towards decarbonization, and also uh, customers were telling us they were that they were highlight. Um, that they were highly, um, that the service was highly convenient for them and um, they particularly like the high quality of a personal service, personalized service with professional drivers uh, who even greeted them by their name. Um, this was allowed through technology because every customer uh, had uh, a booking uh, with their name. So we've seen high ratings in the customer satisfaction surveys. However, uh, at the formal consultation at the end of the trial, we've noticed that uh, actually uh, the community in Devonport had in fact mixed feelings. Um, and there was almost a 50-50 split between bus advocates and on-demand services. So uh, a great number of people were advocating for better transport, for better traditional bus transport. And partly because there were no alternative ways to book, um, those less tech savvy uh, were only left to uh, sm smartphone app options uh, in, during that trial. And it was a very valuable lesson for us at Auckland Transport. As we were designing this next trial in South Auckland, our focus has become to integrate it into public transport offering, into uh, the existing public transport network um, with aspects such as uh, payments, um, with uh, payments through AT Hopcart, Journey Planner, as well as um, AT, engaging AT Contact Center um, to be an alternative um, booking option. So, our first step in designing this new trial in South Auckland was to investigate the potential of on-demand services in locations around Auckland, and particularly in the locations where there was low level of bus service or no bus service at all. We looked at underperforming bus routes. Uh, we've run simulations based on existing and expected travel patterns, and various data have been used in the design process relating to electric vehicles, their charging capabilities, their driving range, and of course, to ensure that um, this new service would fit sim seamlessly into public transport offering, we also had to um, engage and investigate um, the, the solution to integrate and connect it with um, other systems um, that are uh, at the core of um, our uh, public transport network, like payment system with the hop card, um, identity management through uh, the integration of, of, the, of the app, AT Local app, with uh, our existing uh, identity management system, uh, My AT, and also um, integrating it through the journey planner, which is our uh, travel uh, search engine for, for the customers to make it uh, one step closer to the mass ready solution. And next slide, please. Um, specifically about this upcoming trial, um, the one that we are working at this moment, in, in fact, it would be launching this Sunday. Uh, as, as I mentioned, we are in the last um, phases of testing this trial. It's a very exciting time for us all, all here in Auckland Transport. Um, this trial uh, is designed around replacing of an existing underperforming bus route, uh, bus 371, which um, used to operate between Papakura train station and Takani uh, through the area um, uh, of Cowrie Flats and Bruce Pullman Park. So um, east side of the of the train line. So the I would say the right side of the image uh, uh, that you can see here on the slide. Um, but in, in addition to uh, just replacing this bus 371, we also saw an opportunity to actually expand this operating area into um, the areas um, on the side 
on the on the left side of the of the train track, which would be Conifer Grove, Wyatta Shores, and Longford Park. So um, through this trial, we are in fact um, both replacing an underperforming bus service with an on, on-demand rideshare, but also introducing public transport type of service to the areas that didn't have this before. Uh, we are expecting um, that about half of the trips would be to or from the, the train stations, so both Takanini and Papkura train stations. And one of the problems here uh, in this area that we are uh, um, eager to um, resolve is that stemming from high car dependence, um, park and ride facilities at the train stations are uh, full very early in the morning. And this was particularly apparent before the lockdowns when we were um, uh, we were seeing a high level of patronage. Of course, now during the lockdown, it's much lower, although um, we expect uh, it to recover quite soon when, um, when we um, go out of the lockdown. So um, allowing uh, an alternative way to access the public transport um, like trains uh, or other, other buses, um, would, would be a great way to improve access for those citizens who are traveling at um, unusual times or to reduce um, the, the pressure that uh, park and ride facilities are experiencing um, uh, in usual times, of course, not right now because of the lockdown. And generally uh, in this area, we are observing the declining patronage trends, which is a very worrisome um thing to see um, and coupled with the low satisfaction levels and um, this is uh, partly because of um, um, the continuing uh, train tracks um, train repair works and so we're, we're really looking to um, provide some level of service that we would be much greater than whatever um, the, the community there in Takanini Papakura would be used to. So um, through the on-demand rollout, we are hoping to break through the barriers that people see um, uh, in, in the form of the, the traditional unattractive buses. And of course, um, um, we are also hoping that this um, service would be seen as much more convenient, a better access, more attractive, and um, th through a number of meeting um, uh, of um, through a number of um, different ways that we've improved it. So, for example, uh, an average um, walking time to a meeting point would be much shorter than for a traditional bus, but also an average um, waiting time is expected to be much shorter because um, the bus route that we are replacing was very infrequent. It was running at 60 minute interval um, and 30 minute interval during the peaks. Um, yeah, moving on to the next uh, trial that we're also uh, working on, which is in Pukikoi down um, uh, south of Papakura. Um, this is slightly uh, different, but um, the very principles of um, this trial are, are going to be very similar. Uh, we're also using, um, uh, after the, the investigation that we've made, we will also be using three routes this time to replace them with um, the on-demand operating area and sl slightly uh, larger catchment. So wherever the buses were not able to um, operate in because of the infrastructure, because sometimes the roads were too narrow or the turns were too tight, we are uh, going to improve access and, and enlarge the catchment to the areas further away from the Pukikoi town center. And this is a great opportunity and uh, especially a very pressing uh, time for, for, the, for the community at the time when the population is growing and there's a lot of development um, in these areas um, further away from the city center. The area is growing, uh, the population is growing, and we would like to en ensure that these new uh, communities, um, the new sections that are being built, have um, 
the right uh, public transport service from the start so that we could um, hope that these, um, these new um, communities could use public transport and could have access to that from the very early start so that the habits um, could form. And we were, um, as, uh, we're hoping that this would reduce car dependency in the future. So this is slightly larger zone compared to Papakura. And we're expecting uh, also um, quite a high number of traffic to and from the train station. Um, but uh, most other um, service uh, components would be very similar. So this, the service would run similarly to Papakura and Takanini. It would run every day from early morning, 5.30 in the morning, in fact, until 9.30 and on weekends slightly shorter between 6.30 and 8.30. In both these trials, we will be engaging uh, with the um, uh, hop card um, as the only payment me method. So the first would be fully integrated. The customers will use it just like they would on, on regular buses and trains. And uh, maybe let's move to the next slide. Um, um, yeah, I, I would uh, like to summarize here that with the help of technology solution, we have been able to um, conduct early feasibility studies and um, also later more detailed um, simulations which were validating our service design. And of course, the expertise um, from a technology solution uh, like Liftango uh, was uh, very valuable for us, um, that expertise from other similar projects around the world. Um, and in fact, it prevented us from making some or implementing some really hard uh, or, or bad ideas. Um, but also um, the flexibility and patience, of course, to develop a solution that is effectively um, rather customized um, uh, to every project and every area um, and every community and its needs. Um, so the integration with uh, platforms like uh, identity management um, was very critical for us, but also the journey planner. Uh, again, uh, we are very um, happy that we've managed to um, make it as easy as possible for customers who are going to be uh, using uh, to search for um, the travel options in the area and um, um, AT local will be appearing in the journey planner as one of the options and it will be possible to make a booking within a click of a button. And of course we're using a lot of data uh, as the trial will start to monitor the success and inform any future improvements um, as, as we um, move on with the trial. Thank you. Fantastic. Thanks very much, Michael. Lots of interesting stuff to unpack there. And if you have questions for Michael, don't forget to answer, enter those into the Q&A box on your screen. We're going to move on now to hear from Troy O'Day. Troy has over a decade of experience in operations and manages a team of over 220 staff and a fleet of 168 vehicles, which includes contracted commercial charter and Ministry of Education Transportation Services. In addition to his daily duties as a senior manager for Howick and Easton, as if that's not enough to be getting on with, Troy was instrumental in the implementation and ongoing training for and management of the MyMobigo on-demand shuttle service in Half Moon Bay. Take it away, Tony. Troy, sorry. Take it away, Troy. Yes, good morning, everyone, and thank you, Helen, for the, the introduction. That's wonderful. Um, on-demand service for Half Moon Bay, something uh, very different for Howick and Eastern Buses, um, something that um, was innovative and something that we looked at and thought we wanted to be a part of this. Um, in doing so, we had to look very carefully at the areas that we wanted to uh, trial our on-demand service and also um, the partners that we would be involved with in this. So if we go to the first slide, please, Helen. Half Moon Bay, very interesting area, a total population of about 130,000 people. Um, most of those people are commuters. Um, and for the Half Moon Bay area itself, there's a very limited uh, public transport um, routes and availability. And we were aware that um, Auckland Transport were looking to remove one of those routes through lack of patronage. 
Uh, next slide, please. So uh, we, we decided to undertake the project uh, through a lockdown, something very unusual for a business to do. Um, and I'd have to say it was uh, incredibly interesting to put together a project that we had to work remotely with some of our partners. So we decided on a two year uh, project um, using our Transdev family from Australasia and Lift and Go. And we came up with FlyMobi Go. Um, we wanted to provide an on-demand personalized service to the Half Moon Bay area. Uh, we wanted to make that something that would work for the people of Half Moon Bay. And uh, we've expanded that out into the Howick village area now. Uh, had to operate seven days a week. And for us, what we have seen is that 80% of our trips are true on demand. Um, they book on the day, ready to go. And then we have a smaller group of trips that book two or, or four days ahead. And considering how we were going to do this, we drew on um, 114 years of experience in the Half Moon Bay Howick Ward area as a business. We previously serviced that area um, around Half Moon Bay with the Auckland transport buses. Uh, and so we felt that we had an understanding of the demographic and the wants and needs of those people. Yep, next slide, please. So ahead of, ahead of uh, putting this together, um, we got together with Lift and Go and we discussed how and which way we would do this. Public transport in the Half Moon Bay area has been low patron, patronage. Um, it was declining and we had to look at why that was. Uh, part of the problem um, that we perceived was timetabling, um, was the geographic area. It's very difficult to get to some of those bus stops. Um, and the resistance of uh, people in the area to using public transport um, over the years. So we designed a service with Lift and Go that would provide true on demand, a service that was very personable, a service that would be door to door, uh, and a service that they felt safe and comfortable to use to get transport to the ferry and then from the ferry through to Auckland. Um, and then we had to move on to what resources we would need and how we'd be able to manage that, the staffing, the vehicles, um, and of course, the operations team that became involved. We did have very limited data, data to work on. Uh, and so a little bit of it was uh, very much guesswork. It was, how can we make this work? What do we think will work? Um, and we went ahead with the package that we came up with. Next slide, please. So what are the impacts on us as a fleet operator? Um, we've had fantastic uh, feedback from our passengers, uh, our staff, are totally invested in the in the project. Uh, they, from the operations team through to the drivers, the um, the team are engaged with our passengers. We find that in some of the areas, uh, the passengers are unable to use the software, and that's usually age related. So they will call through to the operations team. The operations team will take their bookings personally. We've found that that works very well for uh, people who are struggling with smartphones or computers. Uh, and we still have a solid group of people who do use the software and they use it on a regular basis. The community has been very uh, vocal and active. We have received great feedback through the local uh, media uh, and reports from people who have used the service, continue to use the service or want to use the service because they've heard about it and they would like the zone expanded for us to be able to include them in the available pickup areas. Next slide, please. So looking at our zone analysis, um, our original zone was um, Buckland's Beach down through into, um, we clipped Mellons Bay, we went across the Half Moon Bay and 
we did an analysis around how many passengers used ferry services and how many passengers uh, we expected to get from them. And we had a reasonable response, um, though we had a lot of inquiries from people outside of our existing zone. We were, we were able to work with Lift and Go, uh, who were absolutely um, dedicated and involved with us in getting that zone expansion and looking to how we could improve. And we then added the Howick hub. We moved out through to Cockle Bay um, and right round down to um, almost into Danny Moore. And there was a lower ferry patronage in that area listed in the surveys. However, we picked up a lot more passengers and we, we got some very, very good results from that expansion. Uh, next slide, please. So COVID-19, well, what can we say? Um, setting up a project uh, and a service through a COVID lockdown couldn't have been done without uh, an amazing team such as Lift & Go, who, who worked very, very well with us um, over numerous Zoom meetings, uh, Google meetings and uh, Teams meetings. Um, information was being fired backwards and forwards uh, across the across the Tasman to us in reverse. They had to work with what we could um, provide them electronically. So normally you would expect they would set foot on the dirt, come and have a look, help us, assist us using their experience from previous projects, but this all had to be done electronically. Uh, our Transdev family in Australia also stepped in and, and were able to help, but of course they were unable to cross the border as well. So this was very much a a new uh, way of working, um, but we believe we've had a, an incredible success out of that. Um, and we've really enjoyed working with both of those teams. The um, lockdowns, current lockdowns have put us on hold at the moment, um, but we have received feedback from our uh, regular passengers that they're really looking forward to getting the service back up and running again. Um, we are very flexible. Um, even though the bookings come through, passengers will often call us and say, can we um, change that by several minutes? Uh, and we're able to just to, to work with that. Again, using drivers who are invested in the success of this project has been the success of the project as well. Our drivers understand that um, if they make this work, this will make itself work for them. And um, it's it's often seen that our drivers are out there amongst um, amongst the passengers from the ferry. They're out there amongst the shops and that promoting the service and being very proactive around it. They don't see this as just a job. They see this as a, a project for success and they've truly bought into it. And that in itself has, uh, I believe, kept a lot of our passengers with us. Um, Passengers have been fantastic during COVID. Uh, when we were coming out of it, um, we provided masks on board as a um, as an emergency service, but that wasn't often needed. Uh, we had sanitizers on board, etc., and the passengers thoroughly enjoyed that the ability that they were getting onto a vehicle that provided safety. They were also, um, I think, the comment was our our vehicles smelled fantastic. Our cleaning staff here have used um, some fantastic products to keep the vehicles um, disinfected and very well run. Uh, the software itself um, for ticketing is uh, very intuitive very easy to use, and we have found it to be absolutely um, a key fit to this project. So overall, um, we're extremely happy uh, with where we're at, and we're extremely happy with where we're going with On Demand. Thank you, everyone. Fabulous. Thank you very much, Troy, and impeccable timekeeping. I have lots of questions, but along with everybody else, I will save them until the end. And now I'll introduce our third speaker. So our next speaker today is Rachel Hopkins of Arvida Group. Arvida is a retirement and aged care company listed on the NZX. And Rachel's leading the national rollout of Arvida Good Friends. Good Friends provides services towards older New Zealanders to live well in their own homes. And as part of my own research, I've visited one of Arvida's local sites and they are doing some fascinating things. So I'm looking forward to this presentation very much. 
Rachel's career has included owning her own business in Sydney, working for the world's largest law firm in London, and the Ice House Business Incubator in Auckland. She's an independent director of crowdfunding platform PledgeMe. And as I say, I'm really looking forward to hearing what you have to say. So over to you, Rachel. Ena mana, ena reo, e roranga tirama, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou kato. Thanks so much for giving me the opportunity to share with you what we've been doing at um, Avida Good Friends. We've launched in Christchurch, but we've got plans to roll out around the country. Um, there's a Māori proverb, a whakatoki, that you'll all know, which asks, what is the most important thing in the world? And answers, it is people, it is people, it is people. And so I thought that I would talk to you about the people who take our services and ride with us at our Vida Good Friends Go, um, the people at Liftango who have supported us and integrated our data, and the people who drive our hybrid vehicles and um, deliver our service. So Arvida is a retirement and aged care company and our mission is to transform the aging experience for New Zealanders. And that doesn't stop at our 32 communities around the country. That means everybody who is growing older and wanting to continue to stay active and connected as, as they age, living in the home that they know and love. And Arvida Good Friends is really purposely directed at um, targeting isolation and loneliness and getting out and about is a critical part of that. And so Good Friends Go um, was born out of that idea. Let me tell you about uh, Jock and um, Eleanor who use our service. So uh, Jock is 96 and about four times a week. Uh, our home helpers come in the middle of the morning to get him ready for the day. And while he does that, one of our drivers takes Eleanor, who's in her early 80s, um, anywhere she'd like to go. It keeps her connected to the city. She has a haircut. She meets a friend for a coffee. Um, she'll do some shopping at Ballantines. That is all the things that people told us they wanted from a community transport service the ability to keep doing the things they love, to plan their days and to stay connected. Um, another one of our favorite regulars is Michael. Um, Michael's 92. He uses the app. He rides with us several times a day. So he's on our unlimited subscription. He pays $20 a week and he can call us anytime within our and go anywhere within our service zone. Um, so we take him to our Living Well Center every day. He uh, does one, a personalized fitness routine, has a cup of coffee, heads home. We take him to get his post from the post box. And then once a week, he brings a companion with him. Um, we allow people to bring a companion on their ride and uh, they do their grocery shopping together at the local supermarket. When we're talking about affecting loneliness and isolation, it's important for us not to always be waiting to be asked. And that's certainly one of the areas that we are particularly data driven. We take a lot of time to work out, you know, what are the members that we are seeing? Uh, what are their patterns of driving? And, and what more could they be doing? And so one of the things we did in September were some group rides. The Blossoms and the Daffodils in Christchurch were fantastic. And we offered group rides to members um, where they could go on a trip around, see all the best um, the best of spring in Christchurch and finish with an ice cream by the Avon River. Um, incredibly, incredibly popular. In order to build members and to deliver a great service, it needs to be accessible. And um, Troy and Michael both spoke about the importance of um, having the ability to book rides by phone. And we certainly find that the majority of our members book by phone. Um, the majority book in advance so that their days are really well planned. Um, but over time, with education and with the work of our drivers, we're finding that more and more are using the app on their, on their smartphone or on their desktop, um, desktop to do that. We also have a really easy to understand pricing structure. Either you pay as you go per person per ride $4.50 or you pay per week $20 
and you can ride um, as many times as you want in our opening hours and in our geographic location. So what about the people at Lift Tango who helped us get this going? Um, I think there are three things that you look for um, with technology to enable human services. And one is that it's really easy to get your operations set up quickly. The second is it's really easy for your customers to use it. And the third is that the technology um, enhances and enables your brand experience and your values. And I think there was a, a can-do team, an elegance to the design of the Liftango platform that really helped us do that. We had some real complexities. We're a membership organization and we needed to integrate our membership data with ride data. Um, took a bit of doing, but that works really well for us on a, on a weekly basis and um, allows us to really look after our members using our ride data from the Liftango platform. Uh, my favorite bit of Troy's um, presentation was him talking about the drivers. And I would say that our biggest learning is that our key to the success is, um, is our drivers. We've been lucky enough to secure this wonderful man, Ian. Uh, he's got a heart of gold. He's had a really long career doing all sorts of interesting things. He's got great stories. And he um, is always willing to listen to other people's stories. And that safety, the familiarity, the door-to-door -door service, um, all of that, and the other drivers that Ian has handpicked has really been the feedback and the gold within um, delivering and growing our service in Christchurch. Uh, so look, in my opinion, I think having technology platform behind your operations so that you can build really good data, not just the numbers data, but also that uh, feedback data that of real human stories is really important. And the Liftango platform has been very easy for us to be a technology that helps us deliver the best in human experience. And I think for our Vita Good Friends, all our elements include skills, caring, and technology smarts. And Lift Tango um, and Good Friends Go have had a great partnership. Um, and I look forward to that continuing and growing. Namihi nui kia koto, kia ora. And thank you very much, Rachel. That was fascinating. I'm now going to introduce our final speaker for this section, and that's uh, Tristan Eels. Tristan is co-founder and COO of Lift and Go, or Lift and Go, or Lifty, apparently. <laughs> Um, and they're a leading provider of demand responsive transport technology systems around the world. Tristan is the proud holder of a master's degree in engineering, which he tells me is unused until this day. He has over a decade of experience in management consulting and is a lifelong transport nerd. He says he's proud of his label as the non-technical co-founder of Liftango, and, but is lucky enough to hide this fact by knowing a few buzzwords and having an incredibly strong technical team around him. Tristan, I don't think you're alone in being a transport nerd here today. So over to you to share some of those unique insights. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for that. Uh, thanks, Helen. Hey, so, so interesting hearing the, um, the presentations earlier on. 100% um, transport nerd. I think there's a lot of us here. Also, there may be a few non-data people. So I'm the non-tech co-founder. Again, proud of that label. Um, and sometimes it's the, it's the best person you, in the room that you want to speak about data. Often they can translate it in, in the way that makes the most sense. But I, hopefully I'll leave, I'll leave you guys to judge that by the end of the presentation here. Um, I'm going to keep this one relatively quick because I'm really interested to get to some of the Q&A. There's some great questions that are coming through as well. So I'll rattle through these. Um, so we've heard a few examples here. What is DRT? I'm going to call it DRT. Some people call it on demand. It's quicker with DRT from now on. So you know what I'm referring to. Um, essentially means you know technology dynamically routing vehicles in an efficient and equitable manner. Uh, lots of flavors of DRT across public transport, community transport, we've uh, heard a few examples here. While the concept is not new in itself, um, some of the developments in the tech are, are recently, you know, sort of taken on a new, new lease of life. So the power of the, the routing algorithms, the power of the smartphone, the ability to provide that user experience to, to, the, to the passengers. And what that's meant is for the operations teams, they can be a lot more hands-off, so no routing, no scheduling, 
which means that people can focus much more on the people side of it. You know, the drivers can spend more time. The operational supervisors don't need to be you know, monitoring things in, in real time and so on. Um, and that's one of the other areas that it focuses on is, is tackling the user experience, bringing bus transport or vehicle transport in this way closer to the kind of user experience we're demanding from transport nowadays. So personalized, instant and flexible. That's kind of what people are looking for. Um, and I think, you know, that idea of fixed route buses often being seen as an option of last resort. Um, I think DRT obviously is, is able to begin to chip away at that, 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 um, that concept. Um, maybe flick to the next slide there. Thanks. So why is data important? Well, um, it's the lifeblood of DRT services. So vehicle routings are based on it. Service performance is measured from it. Adjustments to the services are derived from it. Um, it also helps us to assess opportunities for DRT services before they start. So looking at what sort of results we'd anticipate to see before anyone thinks about hiring um, drivers or buying buses. Um, you know, this is crucial when organizations are putting forward a business case for a new transport service is de-risking it before they buy the fleet. You know, that's what we use the data for. I'll just run through a few um, examples of this now. So um, how does this happen? Well, we use a few um, data derived tools that the Lifty toolbox has. Again, I'll refer to us as Lifty. Sorry, apologies for, uh, for that. But your transit scan is, is basically a network analysis tool that we use, enable us to very quickly have a look at an area or a region, assess the existing transport network coverage, find some gaps, assess the demographic and geographic data, and that helps us to build up a set of opportunity zones that we can go to the next stage on. Um, and these are areas that might you know, yield good results from DRT services, and more importantly, they focus on the areas that would not um, and with those two together, we can go to the next stage, which is um, drilling into sort of some serious simulations. If you um, flip to the next slide there. So these sort of simulating exercises are conducted by um, our new mobility team. Um, again, similar to myself, I guess we're a fairly unique blend of data nerd, transport nerd and people person. Rachel touched on the people aspect being incredibly important. And, and they're actually a very rare breed, finding people that can understand data, but can also understand people. And I think that's really important. If you don't have a strong appreciation of the human psychology behind services like this and the importance of that, you can end up missing entirely the point of what the data is showing you and so on. So we are people person first and data person second, I guess. We're also pretty lucky to have some strong partnerships with research organizations. So um, I think Doug Wilson might be on the call here. So Doug and his team at Auckland University um, helped us with some research projects with the MyMobigo team um, with Howick and Easton. So thanks, Gary and, uh, sorry, Thau and Gabby and, and Doug. Uh, just an example of some really good research um, programs that we work on in this space. But the simulation tool itself, it allows you to feed the algorithm itself, uh, a bunch of data, um, a service design, press go. It calculates all the vehicle routings for the day, outputs basically how the service would, would perform based on that input and then you can you know use it to iterate um, adjust tweak and modify and keep running those simulations until you end up with something that that achieves the, the objectives of what you're looking to do so looking at things like empty vehicle running passenger wait times trip deviation times all those metrics are sort of recorded and all this is done on, on that sort of desktop tool which helps you to sort of de-risk before you go anywhere near buying vehicles um, just on the next slide here I think we've had some, you know, I probably can't go much, much further above and beyond what the examples have already sort of talked through today from, from, um, from the team here, but DRT works in lots of regions, fixed, you know, fixed route areas, plugging gaps in timetables between routes. Um, some of the challenges in urban areas are in fact not cannibalizing patronage off existing routes. So we do a lot of work in those examples. Um, the AT local example has some built-in smarts and exclusion zones to prevent us cannibalizing the rail network and things like that. So there's lots of elements that you can build into the, the, the design to ensure that the context you're aiming to serve um, does what it needs to do. I think um, community transport, um, as Rachel mentioned, really interesting sector there, been operated traditionally using a dial ride and sort of manual scheduling for a long time. Um, and actually it's interesting to see the shift of, of the demographics in, of those users. So typically, you know, non-tech savvy would like to call someone on the, on the call center to book a trip. But I think 
you know, there's two parts going on here. There's, there's the education of that sector, but there's also the demographic shift of people who are already technology savvy moving into the community transport um, sector as well. So I think there's, there's um, you know, it's been really rewarding working with the Arvita team and seeing the, you know, the, the real life stories of the people who have been affected by the, the ability to have this, these transport services. So that's a huge thing for us who often work in the, uh, in the basement office on the data to see the real stories that are being influenced. Um, so more, more broadly, um, there's sort of an explosion of, of services across the, across the regions. Generally, there's a movement from trial, you know, tentative trials to pilots, and they're moving towards um, more complex system integrations. So our view is here that system integration is key, and lots more public transport agencies and community transport organizations are building that into their requirements for the tech. Um, and, and again, that's crucial to success. Uh, there's some really good examples we've heard from today, so I won't go into those any further. Also really interesting to note the, um, the experiments going on, you know, relating to mass um, mobility as a service. And, you know, while the RV team haven't called it out as one of those buzzwords, what they're doing is really testing that. They're testing the, the option of providing a all you want to travel service for a subscription type model. And it's really interesting to see the behaviors around how those passengers are responding to booking individual trips and paying for them or getting this sort of subscription type service. Um, next slide there, I think. Um, so while the, the technology itself can bring efficiencies and leveraging mixed fleets in the community, um, I think the social impact one is a really interesting area that's been explored by research groups at the moment. Um, what is the true social benefit of giving someone access to transport that previously didn't have that option? Um, I'm going to call out Ben Kaufman, who's one of the researchers at Griffith Uni. He spent a lot of time on this subject, right? What, what is the impact, economic, social, and health outcomes on transport access? And how, how we shouldn't underestimate that. Um, and often it's in direct conflict with the last line, <laughs> uh, the last bullet point here, but, you know, it, are we looking at a single bottom line or are we looking at a triple bottom line here? So the social, economic and environmental impacts of these sort of transport networks. So there's some really interesting work being done in this space to understand that. Um, next slide. Um, so from here, I think, um, you know, where is DRT headed? Uh, a bit of a cliche, but it's headed the way the passengers want it to, kind of like DRT itself, right? So. What do passengers want? Greater integration with existing services. So Michael mentioned that, they too local. They wanna pay with the same system they do for the rest of their, their trips. Um, they wanna use the same profile information they do for their journey planner. They wanna be able to find DRT through a journey planner, all those sort of things. Um, there's also an appetite for more, so you know, socially and environmentally sustainable service. So electric vehicle fleets are, are becoming much more, much more um, prominent. There's a huge amount still to learn for how electric vehicles can be used in DRT. We're standing to learn a lot here about vehicle ranges, optimizing charging times and so on. So really excited about this project with AT Local to understand that. Um, and I think, you know, there's a lot of research going on into the autonomous vehicle side of it. So how does user experience work when there is no driver on board the vehicle? Um, how do we keep the same level of, um, of user experience and so on? So look, I think that's probably a wrap from me. Um, I'm really keen to, to um, hopefully I haven't gone on for too long here, um, but I think, yeah, I'll, I'll hand back over to the, the facilitator here and look forward to um, repeating some of the questions. Superb, thanks very much, Tristan. And thanks to all our presenters today. Remember folks, if you've got questions, for today's panelists, do type those into the Q&A box on your screen. But for now, I'm going to turn over very quickly to Simon McManus with an update on all things ITSNZ. Simon. Thanks very much, Helen. Yes, uh, kia ora koutou katoa. Uh, I'm Simon Manis from ITS New Zealand. Uh, so we are hosting this webinar today and uh, it's been a, a great one and lots of interest in this uh, emerging solution as well. Um, ITS New Zealand, for those of you who don't know, uh, we're the peak body in New Zealand for intelligent transport systems and future transport solutions. So what does that really mean beyond the buzzwords? Uh, I guess we're looking at technology and tech enabled solutions that really um, help make New Zealand's transport safer, 
more efficient and sustainable. And uh, DRT is a great example of that. It's perhaps not the, the newest solution around, but the way tech is uh, technology, the data is, is really transforming it. I, I think that's what's, um, um, you know, making it such a, 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 a hot topic at the moment. And, and why we're seeing that take off worldwide is you can actually see the data within it and, and justify where, where, it's hap where it should happen and, and how to uh, improve on those services where they're provided. Uh, so just very quickly, um, you can find out more about ITS New Zealand on ITSNZ Dot org uh, and obviously we're on the social medias there just a quick note a uh, bit of promotion for ourselves on upcoming events um, we've got three upcoming events next month um, first of all we're going to be having uh, some more T-Tech reboot series events that's rebooting the conference that was cancelled due to a little COVID blip in Wellington back in June that probably everyone's forgotten about um, but that uh, blip happened when the very day that our, our conference was supposed to happen in Wellington. So we're rebooting that conference and we're now up to the stage where we're, we're um, delivering our papers and presentations. Uh, the themes of the conference this year were sustainability, safety and equity. Uh, so the first event, November 15th, will be on sustainability. We'll have about nine presenters that day and uh, similar on the November the 22nd and the presenters that day will be focusing on safety and equity. So um, stay tuned for more information about those events. We've really just locked them in. Um, so more information to come and uh, it, feel free to register for those. Uh, then the third event coming up in November is our AGM. Uh, those tend not to be very exciting, I will admit, um, but it is a voting AGM, so we'll be uh, appointing a new board, which we do every two years. Um, what is exciting about it is that we'll be featuring Minister Woods, uh, Minister for Transport, who will be announcing the Wakakatahi Innovation Fund at the uh, outset of that event. Um, so I'm sure that will garner lots of attention and uh, we hope to see you there. Um, that's all from me. Sorry for the promo in the middle of this, um, this presentations and uh, it's been really interesting. Look forward to your questions and um, uh, yeah, look forward to seeing you in a future event. Back to you, Helen. Thanks very much, Simon. Now we've got some excellent questions coming in. Um, and so do keep on putting those in through the, the Q&A box. Um, First, I'd like to ask our panelists if they've spotted any particularly pertinent questions in the chat that they'd like to tackle first. So would any of our panelists like to chip in with an answer to anything? If not, I will direct. I'll be happy to start, Helen. Um, I saw a couple of questions in the, in the chat there. Uh, one was about uh, asking about government subsidies and if there is more government subsidy for public transport, what does that mean for these, for private? Uh, arrangements. I think, um, and then there was another question around, do you have vehicles that have wheelchairs? And I just wanted to combine those in our, in our experience. So in, uh, in New Zealand, you can get a special subsidy for traveling if you um, need wheelchair assistance or a special wheelchair vehicle. And what we found in our research is that providers were taking the subsidy and adding that to their price. Um, so that the price was the same um, regardless. And uh, so what we've done at um, Aveda Good Friends, we have a vehicle with a wheelchair um, that you can drive your wheelchair into and you still pay $4.50 per ride per person. Um, and what was really interesting, I, I guess Tristan might be able to talk about this, but um, at another webinar I was involved in, there was uh, one of the partners, Liftango partners in America, and they were putting up a private service against a free public transport service. And they, they had four times the amount of demand that they could actually deliver because people want a premium service that delivers safety and, um, and surety. Fabulous, thank you. Would anybody else like to chip in on those questions? Yeah, I might jump in on Peter's uh, Peter Cochran's question here. So, um, yeah, interesting question, Peter. So around, um, I'm, I think everyone can see it as well. I hope you can. I'll just summarise it. But um, historically, urban developments have responded to transport rather than the way around. Um, so have we noticed any insights 
of the effect that the demand response of transport service has on people's willingness to live in a certain area and so on. I think, um, you know, first off, probably not yet. Um, the reality is the probably one follows the other um, still at the moment and the, the sort of the response times for you know, people making decisions in that space probably a, a little more extended than the length of some of the pilots. But what's really interesting, and it kind of touches on your point here, is that um, a number of development companies, so the larger sort of um, commercial real estate development companies around the world have have taken to launching their own commercial services as part of a development. So building a development in the region in, in Kuala Lumpur, for example, part of that um, offering to the residents is not just the place you live, but how you get to and from the places you want to get to within the region. So build build the community and build a DRT service into the community as part of the attractive offering for, for those um, residents. So it's being, you know, there's a number of ways that that appetite has been shown. First off, delivering the service itself, also taking a closer interest in the existing services and understanding how the data can help them plan for those developments in future. So it's probably a watch this space thing at the moment, but from what we see in the market, those urban developers are absolutely um, focused on how it can offer more more benefits to their residents and are starting to test it in real life. Hope Thank that you. Answers the question. Thank you. Thank you, Tristan. Um, Michael and Troy, have you spotted any questions that you're particularly keen to to prioritise there? I'd be happy to answer to Martin uh, about EVs and HVs, autonomous, autonomous transport. So um, these, uh, we are not evaluating any autonomous transport at this point as part of the AT local project. And one day it would come for sure. Uh, but we are indeed very proud that we do have a, a fleet of electric vehicles that we can already utilize for this upcoming trial. It is a very important aspect for us. And as, as Tristan mentioned also, there are some challenges around that because um, the vehicle shifts uh, will have to look differently. It takes longer to charge the vehicles. So uh, there's a lot of um, um, changes that are required and adaptation of our of, of the ways we, we plan these services. So this is a great way to, to, to learn um, new things, but also uh, given that Auckland uh, has a decarbonization policy and zero emissions policy for all buses, we are bound by that policy for all future trials. So um, any new vehicles or any new trials, including on-demand trials uh, will have to be zero emissions. So this is our focus right now but autonomous is not on the cards yet. I think there's, there's a really interesting point in the research around um, why it's important to have EVs in the community. So, you know, familiarity to the general public of an EV electric vehicle is, is important to people understanding that they can, you know, start to take up those services themselves. So I think it's, you know, it, it's a good, good sign. It's really great to see Auckland Transport taking the lead and, and demonstrating that by putting these vehicles into the fleet so people start to see them and start to understand them a bit more and become more comfortable and familiar with them. And that applies across to autonomous vehicles as much as EVs, but it's, it's about, yeah, making them available and making them de-risking and de, um, also demystifying um, those, those sort of solutions. Excellent, thank you. Now we've got a few questions come in um, so on, uh, fare zones and fee structures. So we've, we've only got one minute left, but we're going to finish with a question on that. So I'm going to direct this one to Troy, particularly. We've got a question from Michael Freeman. Is the expectation to pay a standard zone fare or can a premium be charged? So Troy, perhaps you'd like to say something about the fees. Fare zones and a premium. Well, I know that the business would love to charge a premium, uh, but we have looked at um, what will make the business a success. So we've, we've set our price um, at a rate and we also have a concession rate for um, people to take a hold of as well. And we promote that through the app. So uh, app users will be notified that there is a concession rate coming through um, and they're able to make use of that as they as they use our, uh, our transport. Does that answer it for you, Michael? I don't think Michael um, is uh, actually able to, to speak started, at the yeah, moment, no so we'll, we'll hope that it does and we'll invite Michael yep. to get in touch with you after the webinar if he'd like to, to talk about that in more detail. 
I'm afraid now though our time is up and we are going to have to draw to a close here, but the number of questions that we've had does demonstrate how high the interest in this topic is at the moment. If we move on to the next slide, please, Simon, um, you will find that all the panel members' email addresses are listed here. We've had a chat to them. They're very happy for you to contact them if you do have questions that we haven't been able to answer today. We'll also be sending out a recording of the event so that you can watch the presentations again if you want to, and you can also share them with anyone who was unable to make it today. For now, though, I'd like to thank our panel members very much for their excellent presentations and their engagement with the questions and ITSNZ for hosting the webinar. Finally, thank you to you all for attending. Go well, and we'll look forward to seeing you next time. Hi, Dada. <laughs>